Hello, everybody. This is Zerta with Zerta MTG, and I'm back at it again today with another historic deck tech. So today we'll be going over a little bit of a pet deck of mine I've been working on, Dinrova Devotion. Um, so Dinrova Devotion, there you go. It's the top end of our curve. That's how I got the name. Um, anyway, on to the deck. <clears throat> We're going to start where every non-pure aggro black deck should with four copies of Thoughtseize. The card is absurdly good, gives you perfect information on turn one, and lets you rip the best card out of their hand. Um, also, it's pretty good in the mid-game, which is where I would generally recommend casting it, um, unless, say, your opponent plays a, uh, what is it, Zergoth Triome, the uh, Sultai one. Then you know you probably don't need to thought seize on turn two. You should wait until uh, they're going to drop one of their big spells to maximize your chance of hitting it. But other than that, thought seize just an amazing turn one play for any black deck. Moving on, we have Agonizing Remorse. Uh, we're playing Agonizing Remorse over uh, Thought Erasure because the Exile is a little bit more relevant than the uh, Surveil when we don't have uh, any single cards that would be incredibly powerful to Surveil to. We don't have massively powerful synergies. Um, well, we do, but not quite in the same way. It's more of critical mass synergies. Um, so we're going to be playing to Agonizing Remorse to be able to exile things like Uro and Kroxa, as well as clear the way for some of our three drops, um, instead of just uh, only having Thoughtseize to rely on for that. Next up, three copies of Eliminate, because answering creatures and planeswalkers at two mana is pretty good, but we don't want to overload on removal. Uh, we do still have our own thing we want to do, and overloading on removal, especially removal that doesn't hit uh, <laughs> most of the Planeswalkers in Historic anymore, now that Teferi and, uh, well, Teferi's gone, and um, Narset isn't seeing quite as much play. So, only three copies of Eliminate, uh, four copies of Gifted Aetherborn, because we do need something that stands in the way of uh, basically any creature, and it's a good way to gain life and get some black pips for our devotion. Uh, basically, playing this on turn two against an aggressive deck like Mono Red is the plan for it, but uh, deploying it against something a uh, little bit more grindy, it's not the end of the world, it'll still trade with whatever they do um, because of the death touch, and it'll be able to get in for a bit of damage, and once again, most critically, provide those black pips for our Gary. After that, we have three copies of Yarok's Fenlurker, playing this because we, uh, well, once again, need the Black Pips. We needed another two-drop, and I had uh, opted to just go with something that gives us a little bit of card advantage without being completely embarrassing in the late game. Um, so this coming in would allow us to exile a card from our opponent's hand. There are situations that we can manipulate that to be a uh, important card to them. It's not all that um, significant, though. Mostly it's just here because it has synergies with all of our engines, and it uh, provides a decent amount of card advantage, being one card, and it can uh, occasionally trade for a second threat because of its pump ability. Um, that being said, this is mostly just here because we don't have many other great options. I considered Kite Sail Freebooter, but I really want the card advantage to stick around. Um, also considered Brain Maggot, but the same problem was there. Um, Mostly just as long as I can get a card that both uh, can block and get me card advantage, that's what I want. So if something uh, changes, I will take this out and replace it with something that would be more powerful. But as it stands, uh, I believe this is our best bet. On to our three drops, we have three copies of Murderous Rider, because Eliminate does not kill Ugin, nor does it kill, uh, you know some of the bigger threats that run around in Historic. Um, it also doesn't kill a Mux. Eliminate also doesn't kill Muxus. This does. Although if Muxus is happening, you probably already lost just off of the trigger. That said, Murderous Red is still very powerful. Um, coming down as a 2-3 lifelink, adding that devotion after killing a creature is incredibly good. Um, and it's just a good card to have. It's not embarrassing to play. Um, and we're kind of a good stuff deck, so here we are. Three copies of Phyrexian Arena, I had this at four, but you never really want to draw two. That's a little bit too heavy on your life total, um, and you don't always have the time to deploy it. But if you manage to go Thought Seizure Agonizing Remorse before deploying a Phyrexian Arena, you're generally pretty uh, well set up to start drawing those extra cards and pulling ahead of your opponent. Um, next up, four Thief of the 
Thief of Sanity. Um, the reason we're playing four of those and not four Phyrexian Arena is Thief of Sanity is amazing in multiples and pretty likely to die, unless, of course, you've gone Thoughtseize or Agonizing Remorse, potentially both, but let's be real here, you didn't um, before it. Uh, just so you can clear out the removal, and once this card hits once or twice, the game swings so drastically in your favor that it's really hard to lose. Uh, just drawing your opponent's best cards is as a... Basically, you get to anticipate through your opponent's deck on every hit, and that's just an incredibly powerful thing to do. Um, you do need to be careful, because you can fuel their Uros and Croxes. Uh, so if you steal one of those, don't cast it. It will go to their bin. You will not be happy. But that said, um, it's just such a powerful card, and if you manage to stick it, it's um, just so worth it that I opted to play it even uh, in spite of those facts. Next up, we have our four drops in Fossa Deep Dwelling. I kind of want to play more, but I also uh, don't have that many synergies with it, so two we, uh, two we keep it up. It is mostly here because uh, blinking a Gary or a Dinrova Horror is incredibly powerful. Same with our Hostage Taker down there, um, and our Yarix Fenlurker a lot less, but still pretty powerful. Um, so it's just a good payoff for being in blue. Um, as soon as I started to add the blue cards, I knew, well, I've got to have Thassa now. Uh, curve it into a Grey Merchant, and you're in whew, You're in for a lot of life and a lot of damage to your opponent. Um, drop it in after Dinrova Horror, and your opponent will never have a more lands than they currently have, well, minus the arrow problem, but basically you'll be able to eat through their lands, make them start discarding them, eat through your opponent's entire board, uh, do whatever. Two copies of Hostage Taker, just another very powerful card, um, and one that perfect fit perfectly on my curve because I didn't really have anything else I wanted to do uh, at this slot being able to just exile the threat, so if it is a titan, you can keep it exiled as long as you control the taker. Um, you never really have to cast it, but you know when you do, it is powerful. Taking uh, a Hydroid Krasis can be absolutely backbreaking to your opponent, um, because you not only kill it, and if they kill your hostage taker, it just comes back and dies anyway. But if you actually get to cast it, then uh, the hostage taker just absolutely swung the uh, entire direction of that game. Um, that said, there are things this isn't the best against, but given that we are in blue-black, um, well, things it's not great against, uh, such as more aggressive decks with removal, like the, what's it called, uh, Black-Red Luris. It's pretty serviceable there, but they do have enough uh, enough ways to make this bad that it's not the best. Um, any controlled matchup this isn't very good against, but uh, when there are creatures in play and your opponent isn't going to be sacking them at instant speed or uh, putting together plenty of ways to kill your creature immediately, um, then it's pretty powerful. For Grey Merchant of Asphodel, uh, this card is just kind of our payoff. Um, we don't really have a better top end than Grey Merchant. I've tried plenty of things, trust me. I've tried every walker I could think of, um, and unless you're just playing a ramp package, then this is kind of the best you got, even though it makes you uh, slightly warp your deck around it. Um, it is also powerful enough that that's not truly a problem. I just wish it was uh, a little bit better. It can very, very much stabilize any game that it comes down and you have any kind of board presence. Say you have a Phyrexian Arena out, um, that's just four life right there. So you have Friction Arena and a Hostage Taker. Uh, you just gain five, sw hit your opponent for five. And uh, there are times when this can come down for ten or more and just absolutely end the game for your opponent. Um, and it's, you know, it's reach, it's burn, it's life gain. It stabilizes. It stabilizes. Um, for its mana cost, the body is pretty embarrassing. But... It's not embarrassing to have on board. Um, you just, you know, wish you didn't pay five mana for it. Um, works really well with Thassa. If you can uh, play it after a Thassa, say you had just a curve of Thoughtseize, Aetherborn, missed your three, Thassa into uh, Grey Merchant, then that's one, two. 
three, four right there. And then you get to do it again. So you just domed them for eight, gained eight. Um, and that just increases every turn. Uh, Grey Merchant is kind of the reason to play this deck. So that's where we're at with it. Um, and then we have two copies of Dinrova Horror. Uh, this is kind of our concession to the fact that we can't deal with any enchantments, and there are a few um, that are a problem. Um, not... Well, I guess it's less enchantments. I was just kind of stuck on that. It's more... Uh, it's an answer to anything. You can uh, play it um, bounce whatever your opponent has that you were having a problem with, combine it with Fenlurker, uh, Remorse, or Thoughtseize, depending on how many cards are in their hand, to take it immediately away from them. If they had no cards, it just makes your opponent discard a card that was in play, which is very nice. And if you combine it with the Thassa, uh, then Dinrova Horror just will eat through your opponent's entire board at a startling rate. You think one a turn isn't going to be that bad until you uh, realize that you're basically getting um, your Bolas uptick every turn on your opponent, except you get to choose what it is that they're getting rid of. Um, just once a turn, take that, discard it. Uh, so that is it for the creatures. Um, moving on to the mana base, we have one Castle Vantress, because we may as well. Uh, if we're in blue, we kind of want to have the extra power from our mana base, given we're not uh, in three colors and having access to the most powerful spells in the format. One island to facilitate our fabled passage actually being mana fixing. One Bajuka Bog. I really want to play more Bajuka Bog, but we have such a massive uh, tap lands as it is that I don't really feel that's justifiable. Um, one Castle Lockwain, once again, just trying to get that extra power out of our mana base, and this one is absolutely absurd. Drawing cards on your lands uh, is a great thing to do, and the life be damned. Three Swamps, um, just, once again, kind of need to play some basics. Black is our primary color, um, and it helps facilitate the failed passages doing anything. Four Drowned Catacombs tapped for blue or black, doesn't cost life, but doesn't always come in untapped. Uh, fetid Pools, tapped for blue or black, always comes in tapped, but can cycle. Um, I've considered dropping a temple for this, I'm not entirely positive, um, because I do want to hit a lot of my land drops, and I'm not sure which of those I'd rather have to help me do that. Maybe I'll drop the Triome, um, on, in all honesty. Um, I want to get rid of the Triumph from this deck. It serves no purpose other than uh, being a Fetid Pools, but I do need a second Fetid Pools, so here we are. Um, primary reason I want more of this is it helps work with Drowned Catacombs, and uh, that's pretty good. Temple of Deceit, four, tap for blue, tap for black, Scries, which is very powerful on a land drop. Um, consider it a land that draws you kind of half a card um, because if it ever shuffles a or not shuffles, sorry. If it ever bottoms a card, uh, it's like you drew past it because you didn't want it anyway. So, Temple of Deceit is just a very powerful card. The more I'm thinking of it, the more I definitely know. Because Fetid Pools being good in the late game, Temple's early in the uh, early to mid. Yeah, because of that, I think I'd rather play two Fetid Pools uh, for Temple. I think I just talked myself into keeping it as it is. Um, after that Triome becomes a Fetid Pools. So if you have it, you know, play it. Four copies Watery Grave, the best dual land we have access to, uh, bar none, can come into play untapped, will cost us two life, can come in tapped if we uh, don't need it to uh, be untapped that turn. All around, amazing card. Failed Passage, good mana fixing for the mid game. Um, pretty suspect early, but so be it. Now, you might notice something. I only ever have a single blue pip in any of uh, these cards, and yet I have a considerable portion of my mana base dedicated to blue. This comes from my deck building philosophy being um, I want my lands to always be able to cast um, as many cards in my deck as possible. Um, in other words, I hate uh, the chance that, say, 1 in 10 games, I might uh, not be able to cast my Hostage Taker. I don't think 8 sources of blue would uh, put make me happy with that. 
I would be playing the temple anyway, so the only thing that might change would be I'd drop fetid pools for swamps, uh, triomes, and maybe the fabled passage. But honestly, I think just making your mana base a little more powerful with things like scries and um, cycle lands um, is worth it, and then drowned catacombs is, if you're not going to play it, well, what are you really doing trying to play a second color? It's your second best dual land. Um, shock land would be the only other thing. So if you're in the multiple colors or even if you're just in a mono color, go ahead, play the scry lands. They're pretty powerful. Play the cycling lands. They're also pretty powerful. Um, but I just feel that even if they come into play tapped sometimes, my curve isn't super crucial because I'm not trying to curve out aggressively. Um, I just need to be sure I cast Thought Seize by turn two if I have it, that uh, I have access to removal spells, so I only really need one on tap land. But that being said, I could see cutting maybe the cycling lands um, in favor of two swamps, but bear in mind, you know, you might have a few more problems with your mana if you do that. You might not be able to go uh, multi uh, blue spell in the same turn. I would definitely not increase the uh, only blue source count at all because of all of our uh, double black spells and how much black we have in the deck. But yeah, that's basically it. This is Din Rover Devotion. Um, this has been Zerta with Zerta MTG. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please remember to uh, drop a like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next video.